This is a podcast from the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. This is Gib Clark with the Woodrow Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. After a recent event at the Rayburn Building on Capitol Hill, I had the chance to sit down with Lester Brown, founder and president of the Earth Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Lester's latest book, Plan B 3.0, Mobilizing to Save Civilization, discusses diverse and interrelated challenges such as energy and food security, climate change, environmental degradation, and population growth. In your book, Plan B 3.0, you lay out a variety of pressing problems. Um, if you could prioritize them, could, would you say that there's one problem that is more pressing above all the others? Probably if I were to pick one today, it would be climate change. Um, traditionally, I've, I've, I've um, when, when looking at what we need to do, I think stabilizing climate and stabilizing population are the two big ones. If we fail at either of those, we're in serious trouble. Um, and by we are in serious trouble, I mean civilization is in serious trouble. Um, if we think about climate change and what it can translate into, I mean, ice melting, for example, the Greenland ice sheet melts, sea level rises 23 feet, and we have hundreds of millions of rising sea refugees. I mean, it would be chaos. Um, so we've got to we've got to begin to respond to the challenges that we're facing and that we have created um, ourselves in a, in a meaningful way, and we're not. We're not doing that very well right now. You, you mentioned, along with stabilizing climate, stabil stabilizing population. Could you say a little bit about right. the issue, mm -hmm. the problem, and a little bit about what you think can be done? Mm -hmm. One of my sort of bottom line concerns in the world today is the growing number of failing states. Each year, that list of failing states gets longer. And if you look at, if you look at the top 20 countries on that list, at least 14 of them have rapid rates of population growth. By rapid, I mean from close to 2 percent to 3.5 percent. And these are countries where um, water tables are already falling, soils are eroding, forests are shrinking, um, where the environmental support systems of the economy are deteriorating and deteriorating at an accelerating uh, rate. So this is uh, one of the big challenges. I mean, if you look at the projected addition of close to 3 billion people in this country during this, the current half century, um, you see that almost all of them will be added in countries where water tables are already falling, where food is in short supply, um, where forests are, are uh, disappearing. Um, so. The, the link between population growth and political stability, um, security, are, are much stronger than I think we realize. One of, the, um, one of the characteristics of a failing state is a decline in personal security. Countries like Somalia or Haiti or Democratic Republic of the Congo or Afghanistan, even Pakistan now, where the government can no longer guarantee the security of its people. And, and that's, that's one of the first sort of key indicators of, of state decline. You suggest in the book that what is needed some, is something very big and implemented relatively quickly. Could you please offer a, a brief explanation of what it is you're proposing, how it will work, and the one or two biggest hurdles you, you see in its implementation? I think it was um, when the Elizabeth Colbert was asking Amory Lumba, L Amory Lovins, the energy efficiency expert, uh, about thinking outside the box, and Amory said there is no box, and I think that's where we need to be now. We need change, big change, bold change, and it has to come fast. We don't have a lot of time. Time is running out. If you look at the various environmental indicators around the world, whether it's falling water tables or shrinking forests or deteriorating grasslands, collapsing fisheries, eroding soils, dying coral reefs, rising CO2 levels, ice melting, I mean, go down the list. And we don't have a lot of time to turn these things around, but we know if they continue, 
they will undermine civilization as surely for us as it as the environmental trends undermine the Sumerians or the Mayans or or many other early civilizations, um, and and it, it's so complex now. I don't think it's it's easily or or widely understood. Um, those of us in the environmental field have been saying for decades, you know, we need to save the planet. Well, that's true, but what we're now really talking about is saving civilization itself, because the environmental stresses and are are beginning to translate into political stresses and a deterioration of political systems, and and that's the real challenge to look at the economic, environmental, and political systems sort of simultaneously, and as you know, it's it's difficult even to model the climate part of the in uh, you know of, of of the of the natural uh, system, much less. Uh, all of these other things and their interactions, and it's it's complex, but it's going to take bold um, uh, leadership. And and one of the things I point out with civilization at stake is that we all um, have a stake in saving civilization. I mean, we all have children, and some of us have grandchildren. Um, and it's if if we if we if we fail, then there's not much hope for the future. And the exciting thing now is that we're beginning to see things happen on a very bold scale. We're seeing this most dramatically with renewable energy, whether it's what's happening in Texas with wind energy or solar energy in North Africa or geothermal energy in Indonesia, for example. Suddenly look at, looking at, at, at not marginal incremental thinking in these fields, but huge uh, sort of bold moves into the future. Um, so it's it's going to be a race. It's a race between natural tipping points on the one hand and political tipping points on the other. I mean, can we close coal-fired power plants fast enough to save the Greenland ice sheet? Or will we be too slow and will the Greenland ice sheet disappear? And will we have to cope with a 23-foot rise in sea level? Given the enormity of the problem and sort of the enormity of the response you're proposing, what can a single NGO or a single person or even something larger such as um, a single government agency do um, to make an impact? Well, um, often um, when I'm giving talks around the world, individuals will ask that question, what can I do? And I think they expect me to say, well, you know, recycle your newspapers and change your light bulbs and so forth. And those things are important. But we've got, to, we've got to restructure the economy now. We've got to change the system. And that means we have to become politically active. And by that, I don't mean just voting in elections, important though that is, but it means taking an issue and joining the, the movement to ban uh, new coal-fired power plants in the United States, for example, or um, developing a world-class recycling program in your community or joining a population group to help get the brakes on world population before it spirals out of control, for example. So it's that engagement by us as individuals, by uh, as NGOs or government agencies or, or corporations. Um, we've got we've to change the system. And the key, as I think about corporations, um, is we've got to restructure the, the tax system so that the market begins to tell the truth. And the key there, of course, is reducing income taxes and offsetting that with a rise in the carbon tax. No change in the amount of tax we pay, but simply restructuring the tax system to steer the, the energy economy in an environmentally sustainable direction that is away from fossil fuels and toward wind and solar and geothermal. If you'd like to learn more about climate change and energy security, visit us on the web at www.wilsoncenter.org ECSP or visit us on our blog, The New Security Beat, at www.newsecuritybeat.blogspot.com.